Hello and welcome to the Provision Podcast on Alexander II's other reforms. So why did Alexander bring in these reforms? Well, it's the same reasons as emancipation for many of them. The Crimean War, um, moral reasons, the inefficiency of the current system holding Russia back. For example, no education, or little education anyway. Many of them were necessitated by the emancipation edict themselves. For example, uh, the new judicial systems had to be put in place as the uh, noble had lost his role uh, as judge. By undermining the landed interests and the role of the nobility in local government, the emancipation struck a serious blow at the effectiveness of the Tsarist government. The subsequent reforms were there to repair the damage that had been done. However, did the reforms need to be so liberal? Were they liberal or just pragmatic? Economic reform. Rutin was appointed Minister of Finance from 1862 to 78. He created a unified treasury and centralised the administration system. There was better auditing after 1862 budgets were published. In 1863, a system of excise duties replaced the medieval system of farming out licences to sell certain goods. It was a modernised and streamlined fiscal organisation. Government subsidies were given out in attempts to stimulate the Russian economy by establishing a railway network. In Alexander's reign, miles of, the miles of track rose from 700 miles to 14,000 miles. Investors were given guaranteed dividends each year to encourage foreign and unsure Russian investors. The railways themselves were used to expand grain exports, where most of Russia's revenue came from. These grain exports rose from 26 million tonnes up to 86 million tonnes between 1864 and 1880. There were better credit facilities... Financial institutions were developed. Rutin's sound administration and encouragement led to explosion of banks, 278 by 1878, and other loan and savings companies. These replaced the traditional moneylenders. Now people could raise more money for investment. There was a state bank introduced in 1860. In 1859, foreign Jews and those who paid high taxes were allowed out the pale and could live and trade throughout the empire. This was increased to other Jews, such as soldiers and artisans. Despite this, Jewish schools were closed after 1863. Tariffs were lowered in 1877 and there was more liberal trade policies. The cotton industry was expanded, partly because of the American Civil War and the lack of available cotton there. The coal and iron industry started in Donetsk. So what were the limitations in the economic reforms? There is still a lack of entrepreneurial spirit. The government was still dependent on taxing peasants via poll tax, indirect taxes on salt and vodka, etc., and new redemption payments. There's no real tax reform at all, apart from how to collect it. The published budget was of limited value, seeing as no parliament was there to scrutinise it. The budget was still not really balanced, and there was very slow railway expansion. Russia's economy still was relatively weak, as Russia was still paying off huge debts, and the ruble was unstable and subject to wild variations in value. So what were the effects? The government was more financially stable, and beginnings of industrial transformation sped up in the 1890s and begun. Church reform. The Ministry of Internal Affairs set up an ecclesiastical commission to look into the church in 1862. In 1868, the commission set out its proposals, which were uh, to allow talented priests to gain promotion. There was a relaxation of restrictions in Poland on Catholicism at the start of the reign. Limitations of church reform. Relaxations on Catholicism reversed after the Polish revolt in 1863. There was little done to address the concern about clerical poverty or suitability of rural priests to do their job. Military reform. Problems were seen to be transportation, command structure, administration, barbaric discipline, conscription being too long and often avoidable. In 1859, conscription had been reduced to 16 years from 25. Dmitry Milutin was appointed as Minister of War and lasted for 20 years. He was supported by the Tsar's brother, Constantine, who was head of the Navy, and there were similar reforms there. Modern weapons were introduced and railways were used for strategic purposes. In 1862, four regional commands were set up to improve efficiency by decentralising administration. In 1964, a further six were introduced. Extreme discipline was ended. There's no branding, for example. Military colonies were ended and there's better medical care. Criminals could not now be sentenced um, to conscription in the army. Army Junker schools were set up and open to all. By 1871, 12% of them were not from the nobility. 1874 saw all classes made liable to conscription and substitute conscripts were forbidden. Services limited to 15 years with only around 7 spent on active service. 
Education even gave you time off active service if you had an education. Milutin had to fight conservative opposition to all these reforms at all stages, but received backing from the Tsar, who said Russia must be able to defend itself. The limitations of military reform. There was considerable noble opposition, which delayed the reforms until after Prussia's victory over France in 1871, which finally convinced them of the need for the reforms. The general staff was still burdened with too many regulations and not enough clear duties. Army doctors could still be bribed to declare men unfit, so they could avoid conscription. There was still low education of conscripted men, which limited effectiveness of training. And the quality of training and leadership still trailed behind the Germans, um, which were formerly the Prussians. The effects of military reform. All men were treated equally. This is probably the most democratic of all the reforms. The reduction of 25-year conscription um, lifted the threat of what's seen as a, a lie sentence. Army taught men to read, which increased literacy. The Russian army fared better in the Russo-Turkish War in 1878, although it still took longer than expected for victory, and they lost in 1904-05 to uh, Japan and in 1917 in World War I. There was a smaller but better trained army with less of a burden on government expenditure. It didn't threaten autocracy, apart from possibly the increased literacy. Local government reform. Before emancipation, the landlords had had responsibility to construct roads, etc., but now there was a void. Was the uh, Zemstva compensation to nobles over emancipation? Well, in 1864, the Zemstva were set up. They were locally elected councils given responsibility for public education, public health, local economic development, road building and the provision of water and fire prevention. They were to administer poor relief in hard times. They were two-tiered. There was a district Zemstva, the Oost, and the provincial Zemstva, the Gubernia. District Zemstva seats were divided, 45% nobility, 40% to the peasants, and 15% to the townspeople and clergy, the middle classes. These then elected representatives to the provincial Zemstva, so they tended to elect nobles to the provincial Zemstva. In 1870, Duma, or town councils, were set up in towns. The limitations of these bodies. Taxes still favoured the nobility. The provincial Zemstva dominated by the nobility and preserved the interests of those who sat on them. The Zemstva couldn't discuss or have power over imperial taxes. They, the Duma had no control over the police. The provincial governors still appointed officials and could override the Duma Zemstva if he wanted. There was a slow spread. By 1914, only 43 of the 70 provinces had a Zemstva. There's no National Assembly or Duma or Zemstva on a national level. The effects. The impact was varied in different places. It improved local administration due to local knowledge. It demonstrated how the people could look after themselves without the Tsar. There was a more local level representation than many Western countries even had, and it did provide a talking shop for in intellectuals. Legal judicial reform. A new freedom of search required an overhaul of the law, especially concerning property. The nobility wanted protection from any backlash or challenge from peasants. Before, a serf was presumed guilty. He had no right to defend himself, have a lawyer or even appear to the judge in person. There was no jury, the evidence was written and prepared by the police and landowner rather than the serf. Equality before the law was now established. Legal flogging was curtailed. Criminal cases were to be heard by, before barristers and a jury and were open to the public and the accused could see the judge and have a lawyer. There was a clear hierarchy of courts and courts of appeal were set up. Volos courts set up uh, and they, would, they decided um, on emancipation issues which had peasant judges elected for three years. JPs or magistrates dealt with minor issues in local courts and were elected by the Zemstva. Judges were given better training and more pay so they were less easily bribed, and legal reporting was removed from censorship. The limitations of this were judges appointed by the Tsar still, and they were still influenced by the government because they could get promotion given by the government. After the Vera Zizulic um, case, where she was acquitted for terrorism in 1878, it was decided that all political crimes were to be dealt with by separately special courts. The reactionary Constantine Palin was promoted to Minister of Justice in 1866 and he held some open show trials to deter, deter observers. Although this backfired with the trials of 50 and 193 which made the government appear incompetent when most of those were found innocent and the defence speeches were reported in the press and became free publicity for the radicals. The third section was led by the revolutionary Peter Shuvalov from 1866 
and operated outside the law using these special courts and arbitrary arrest. Even radicals who fled to Switzerland were tracked down and brought to justice. Trial by jury never was established in Poland or the Western provinces and the Caucasus. The church and the military courts were exempt and um, peasants in the Volos courts were still treated differently from those of higher status. And there was a slow introduction due to a lack of lawyers because there was no or very little middle class in those days in Russia. The effects of these um, judicial reforms were um, the most thorough and remarkable of all the reforms. They were readily accepted, they broke with tradition and they were a great success. It created a rise in middle classes due to the need for more lawyers, etc. The freedom um, of the courts and the openness of the courts gave people opportunity to criticise the regime and it increased the atmosphere of debate. Educational reform. The church wanted to restrict education of the people, but the emancipation increased the need for literacy and numeracy amongst peasants. The liberal Golvenin was appointed in 1861 as Minister of Education. Under then, there had been strict control over education. In 1864, the Zemstva and later the Duma were put in charge of developing primary education and they were encouraged to expand it. Primary and secondary schools increased by fourfold by 1881. Schools were open to all regardless of class and sex. Schools were put under the Ministry of Education rather than the church, and prizes were offered for the best textbooks and educational quality improved. Secondary school students were given the choice between classical or the more modern subjects. The university regulations of 1863 were Goldman's most famous contribution. They changed the basis of university activity, allowing freedom of expression. Universities were given freedom of expression and virtual autonomy in administration, for example, appointing staff. The teaching of law was upgraded. The foreign texts that uh, were allowed in were not subject to censorship. Scholarships were set up to help the best students. Tolstoy introduced classical curr- curriculum to high schools and other reactionary measures, but they weren't seriously repressive later on. Limitations of this. Curriculum was still prescribed by the Ministry of Education, although there was free- freedom, um, greater freedom allowed in the presentation of it. In 1866, a former student from Kazan University tried to assassinate the Tsar, and a commission was set up to investigate, blaming the relaxing liberal educational policies, and Golvenin was replaced by Dmitry Tolstoy, who tightened the entry to universities and other harsher laws, or not too much, such as stress on traditional subjects, allowing only students studying traditional subjects to go into universities in 1871. Zemstva's ability to control education was reduced, and the church was reinstated. There's a ban on extracurricular student groups, for example, debating groups. There's periodic persecution of students, for example, in 1861, where many universities were closed, and the primary school curriculum was still restricted. The effects of education reforms were massive increase in women going to universities, 2,000 by 1881. The number of primary schools rose from 8,000 in 1856 to 23,000 in 1880. The number of children in primary school education rose to over 1 million. The student number rose up to 10,000 by 1870, and this increased radical thinkers.